Welcome to worship with Westminster Presbyterian Lincoln, Nebraska for our virtual service. And as a reminder, we continue to gather as a community for those who feel comfortable uh, in our sanctuary at 9.30 a.m. each Sunday morning. And it's a wonderful to be able to see folks, but it's also wonderful to be able to be in your home this morning as we worship God together. So this week we will look at the story of David and Goliath through some new lenses perhaps or maybe some different air ways that we will consider that story. And as we hear that story, I want to be mindful of our first hymn, We Shall Overcome. It's a hymn that I'm familiar with partly through some of my racial reconciliation work professionally uh, before moving to Lincoln in, with the Path to Peace organization as one of their supporting pastors in South Alabama. That song would kind of bubble up in the life of folks as we met together and as we marched in a sign of racial reconciliation and unity. Uh, that song would, again, kind of bubble up within the crowd as a song that we sang together. It's a song that has been important historically within communities seeking to lift up the marginalized, specifically in the work of desegregation in the South, but also in work for rights for those of different races in the life of our nation. So as we hear that song today, we're mindful of that in the remembrance and the reminder that God lifts up and cares for the lowly and the marginalized in our different cultures. We'll see that God leads those who may be seen as underdogs in the life of this world in our sermon today. Next Sunday, I want to invite our kids, our youth, our families, our parents and guardians, grandparents to join us for a family uh, and friends night of a movie outside at 8.30 p.m. If the weather doesn't cooperate, we'll head inside to Fellowship Hall, uh, but we uh, invite you all to join us for Ferdinand. We'll have the popcorn machine out and all those good things happening, uh, so we hope that you'll join us. Bring a, a blanket or a lawn chair, that sort of thing, so that we can uh, gather together and enjoy the movie Ferdinand. So thanks to Trish Soulier, our Director of Children, our Director of Children and Family Ministries for putting that together for us and the great work of the Children and Youth Committee to pull that event together. We'll continue to celebrate and look forward to that event next week. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God with gladness. Our call to worship is a time to unite our voices in praise and to center our hearts and minds on worshiping God. Let us join together with the words from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, like the dew that falls on the mountains of Zion. There the Lord ordained Aaron's blessing, life forevermore. Lord, hear our praise and gratitude for new life and life together as your children.
we strive to be strong and self-sufficient, but in truth, we are in constant need of grace. In penitence and faith, let us confess our weakness to God and to one another, first silently and then together as one voice. Most merciful God, forgive us. We imagine that we can live without you when you give us our very breath. We seek control over others rather than striving to live in unity. We allow fear to overtake us even though our lives are in your hands. Draw us back into your steadfast love and shape us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Siblings in Christ, hear the good news. Grace is poured out like water. Mercy flows like a never-ending stream. Live then as those who have received new life, rejoicing in your baptism. Believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. special to show your dad just how much you appreciate him. I am so glad that you all are here with me today so that we can be together and talk about God. I brought some rocks with me because they kind of remind me of today's story. Today's story comes from the book of 1 Samuel. Just a quick reminder, the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the big part of the Bible at the front that has all the epic stories from before Jesus was born. In the back part of the Bible, the smaller part is the New Testament, and that contains the stories from after Jesus' birth. So in our story today, the Israelites are fighting the Philistines. People fought a lot in the Old Testament, so that's nothing new. But what is a little different about this situation is that the champion of the Philistines issued a challenge. He said he would fight the Israelites' champion, whoever lost would surrender and agree to be ruled by the victors. Well, the Philistines' champion, his name was Goliath. And Goliath was huge. He stood nine feet tall. Just to give you an idea of how tall that actually is, the tallest player in the NBA right now is Taco Fall with the Celtics, and he only stands seven foot five. But Goliath wasn't just tall. He also was a mighty warrior. He wore armor all over his body, and he carried a spear and a sword. So every day for 40 days, Goliath went to the battlefield and issued his challenge. And for 40 days, none of the Israelites dared to accept his challenge. But here's where it gets really interesting. The hero in this story, his name is David, and he's a shepherd boy. Last week we met him when Samuel came to anoint him. That means he poured oil on his head to mark him as the next king of Israel. I know, a shepherd boy becoming king. Go figure. Well, in this story, David was tending his flock when his dad asked him to go take lunch to his brothers on the battlefield. When David arrived on the battlefield, he heard Goliath bellowing out his challenge, and he waited to see who would accept. When no one did, David was surprised and actually a little angry. It was humiliating to have this giant oaf 
tossing insults out about his people, about God's own people. So David accepted. Now remember, David was a shepherd. So David had no armor, no sword, no spear, and no training. All he had was a sling, five stones that he had found in a, in a stream nearby, and God. Turns out that was more than enough. David resisted everyone's attempts to hold him back or armor him up, saying that he had God and that was all he needed. David faced Goliath down on the battlefield just as he was, a shepherd boy with a sling. And with a single stone, David took Goliath down. Now it's highly likely that you will not be asked to face up down a nine foot tall giant. On the other hand, there are other giants that we all face in our lives. Things like bullying or making new friends, maybe failing at school or in sports. David had five stones that he used to take down his giant. But we have rocks of our own. They live in our hearts. And you may not be able to see them, but they're there and you can rely on those to help you to slay any giant that you may come across. Here are what those rocks represent. The first rock represents courage. David had to have a lot of courage in order to face down Goliath. He told Saul that he would take care of everything, and he did. You will definitely need courage to face your giants. The second stone represents confidence. As a shepherd, David used his sling to protect his flock from wild animals, and that gave him the confidence he needed when it came time to face Goliath. Now, David also had confidence that God would be there to take care of him. He said that if God had protected him from wild animals, he would surely protect him from Goliath. You too can have confidence that God is with you and confidence in the abilities that God has given you. The third stone represents focus. All of the grown-ups in this story viewed Goliath as this huge, unbeatable foe, somebody that they had no defense against. But David, David saw him clearly. He saw his strengths and his weaknesses and understood how David could use his own strengths to beat Goliath. You will need focus to be able to look to see what's underneath the surface and not visible so that you can analyze your own skills and see what God's given you. The fourth stone represents preparation. David didn't go into this battle unprepared. He had started off preparing by using his sling when he was protecting his flock. Now, he didn't know he was going to need this skill, but he honed it anyway. And then when it came time for the actual battle, he went to the stream and collected his five rocks for ammunition. Preparation is key in all areas of your life. Don't ever forget preparation. And the final stone is trust. David didn't just trust in his own skills. He also trusted God. When Goliath came at him with insults and threatening to kill him, David said, you come at me with a spear and sword but I come at you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. You can trust that God is with you. You can trust the things that God is giving you. You can trust God to help you to face down all of your problems. So the next time you come up against a ginormous giant, remember David and Goliath and the five stones. And in this coming week, as you come up against your problems, whether they're large or small, remember these five stones. Courage, confidence, focus, preparation, and trust. And think about how you can use those to help you to triumph. All right, guys, have a great week. Happy Father's Day. Have a great weekend. Let us pray. We are waiting, O oh God, to hear your word, for in your word is our hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we hear your voice and be attentive to what you will say to us today. In the name of Christ, we ask this and all things good. Amen. As I shared at the beginning of the service, today's lectionary story is David and Goliath. And I want to be very clear, there's some strong imagery in this story. If you think about it from the lens of the ch children's story that we often hear, it's pretty tame generally, but it gets a little ramped up in the actual scripture for a number of reasons that we'll explore in the sermon. You know, I picked these stories throughout this sort of series looking at God doing certain things. God responds, God sees, and today God leads. 
because we wanted to walk through some stories of the Old Testament and kind of learn more about the ways that Israel, as God's tribal chosen people, were then led into this situation and reality of being a monarchy and a, more of a player on the world stage at the time of the Bible times. So that's part of why we're looking at these stories, and today is a great one, but I did want to just say, share the reality that there is some pretty strong imagery within it and a little bit of trash talk, but we'll get to that in the sermon. 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 49. David said to Saul, the king, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and wherever a lion or a bear came, and took a lamb from our flock. I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag, in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, a ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give you flesh, your flesh, to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out his stone, and slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, each year, the National Basketball Association holds a slam dunk contest in conjunction with their all-star game. I love trying to watch it. Over the course of several rounds, players try to achieve the most points and by having the most impressive slam dunks possible that will impress the panel of judges who are retired NBA players. For those less familiar, the NBA dunk competition is sort of like presenting a thesis before your professors or uh, like a diving competition in how it's scored. But for one for tall men who can slam dunk a ball into a 10-foot-high hoop. 
So in 1986, going back a few years obviously, the height of the contestants in the NBA dunk contest were as follows. Six feet nine inches, six feet seven inches, six feet six inches, six feet five inches, five feet six inches. Yes, you heard that right. Five foot six, somewhere is listed, sometimes listed as five foot seven. That is the height of a guy named Spud Webb, a point guard for the Atlanta Hawks at the time. So just FYI, point guards are typically the shorter players on the court. Now I'm right at five feet nine inches, three inches taller than Spud Webb even was. So I can say that confidence that most of us in the world, at least in, from my perspective, most of us below the, kind of that 5'10 threshold have really only celebrated a slam dunk if it's on one of those little rims that connects to a trash can or the floating rims in a pool that you can get up over. So Spud was a surprise at 5'6, just between 5'6 and 5'7, a surprise entry to that 1986 dunk contest. One of his own teammates, Dominique Wilkins had never even seen Spud dunk in a game or even a practice just to show his skills. So not only in the contest did Spud Webb dunk at five feet, six, seven inches, he did things like throwing the basketball off of the backboard and then slamming it down and having a full 360 degree spinning dunk. That's some really cool and impressive stuff. So Spud finished the tournament with two perfect score dunks to win the finals over his own teammate who was known for dunking. So when Spud Webb appeared on the scene for the contest, no one even thought that he would be able to pull off a very simple dunk, much less win the whole thing. But sure enough, Spud knew his capabilities. He knew what he was comfortable with. He put in the work on some spectacular dunks in his own time practicing, and he won the whole competition, but no one expected him to win. Now, today's sermon title is God Leads, and we read that story of the young, smaller David defeating the massive Goliath a minute ago. And I want to be clear on one thing. Sometimes we can read things into what someone says. I do not know, believe that God actively led Spud Webb to win the 1986 dunk contest. I don't think God was necessarily uh, holding out a puppet of Spud Webb to help him get higher in dunk or anything like that. But what I want us to take away is that there are some strange and kind of ironic similarities in how characters other than David in scripture and how they reacted similar to players and fans who viewed Spud Webb's possibilities in the contest. And both stories can, again, kind of oddly, help us consider how we view the underdogs in life. Unexpected, the written off, the less culturally appreciated who seek after God, because we believe that in those circumstances, when they seek after God, even as an underdog, God leads. So in 1 Samuel 17, 1, a verse that we haven't heard yet, the story of David and Goliath starts with the Philistines preparing for battle and threatening the Israelites. So the story is set up right away from the perspective of the Israelites being underdogs who are being threatened by this other group of people. So one point I want to address is the question of the historical accuracy of this story. It comes up quite a bit and we wonder about it as many of the stories in the Bible that are maybe grander than life as it seems with the God that we know who can do impossible things. On one hand, there's really good archaeological evidence that the Philistines and the Israelites had battles against each other during the 11th century BCE. They were two competing people groups. We see it throughout these stories in Samuel as well. Michael Coogan, who is an Old Testament professor at Harvard Divinity School, notes that significant amounts of Philistine pottery have been uncovered in the areas of Israelite territories during the reign of Saul, or that Saul over Saul. And that the Israelite destruction of, or sorry, the 
Philistine destruction of the Israelite city of Shiloh that's named in the Psalms correlates with a destruction uncovered by excavations at Shiloh. Now, that helps us to know that the facts behind the story, the tension between the Israelites and the Philistines, was very real. And these are why, that's one reason why a lot of these stories were recorded later. So the basic setting makes sense. Though there are maybe some reasons that we could see, maybe the story is at least a little bit embellished, or maybe the height of Goliath is embellished. The later Israelite historians were actually really wisely recording these stories that had been passed down for a few generations in villages and around campfires. Stories that were important for building up the Israelites in later years when they were in captivity. These stories helped them when they were very much the underdog, when they were suppressed and oppressed and enslaved. The truth is, though, that there were not 24-hour news, TV news embedded reporters with the Israelite or the Philistine armies as the Philistines encamped between the, town, the areas of Soko and Azekah when the Israelite encamped on the other side of a mountain preparing for this battle. But for Christians today, I believe the historical accuracy of every single detail here is really not the most important point or something we need to worry too much about. I believe it's more important to consider how the Israelites understood God's presence and God's leading in these stories. Again, the questions that we'll look at today are, why might this story have been important culturally for the Israelites? Where did the Israelites see God's presence in the story? And lastly, another one, what can we take from this story to encourage our lives of faith today? Now, culturally, the answer is fairly clear. The story of David and Goliath continues to build up David as a leader who did great things despite being young in this story and being not the biggest guy around. The story of David and Goliath also builds up the Israelite people as they seek to establish themselves, as they seek to be on par or even above the other tribes in the area that had been more established. First and second Samuel tell the dramatic, fantastical tales of how the Israelites made the transition to being a more established kind of player nation in in these scenes, but also how they shifted to becoming a monarchy from more of a tribal nomadic people. Now, I can, in the story, we hear Saul, the acting king, tell David that he's just a boy, while Goliath has been a warrior from his youth. I can imagine David puffing up his chest, and as he tells about how he would take down the lions and the bears who threaten his family's flocks. In the midst of this, we hear David and later Goliath trade barbs back and forth, jawing like two boxers at a weigh-in before the prize fight, tying their trash talk to even religious and cultural traditions such as Israelite circumcision. And if we look at these statements culturally, they start to get pretty insulting and pretty tribalistic again. And as I look back, I even feel, felt a little bit of discomfort as I read this scripture and heard that tribalism. Because when we feel discomfort at such stories today, it should be a lesson for you and me to examine our own words and our own tribalistic tendencies based on religion or neighborhood or politics or race. When we feel that discomfort, we recognize that these stories were important to a past culture who viewed David as a great leader who was led by God toward a win against the biggest warrior from the other tribe, continuing the Israelites' cultural ability to just exist. So we started answering the second question there as well. Where did the Israelites see God's presence in the story? I see in the text that the Israelites see God's presence with David, God's leading with him in this battle. And there's no question that there are plenty of scriptures that reveal that the Israelites saw God as a God who was with them in physical battle. Even though they were fearful enough of the Philistines to have asked Samuel, as we heard a few weeks ago, to ask God for a human king to lead them. 
And God said it will not go quite as well as you would like. Then as we saw last week, the Israelites see God and David as God's anointed one, their eventual next king and leader, despite his age or stature. Looking back, the historians hope to tell these stories in a way that would be inspirational for their current generation hearing them. So as we saw last week in the story of David's anointing and in Psalm 147, God does not favor based on one's size or shape or stature or wealth, but God gives strength to those who hope in God's steadfast love. So that third question, what can we take from the story to encourage our lives of faith today? For our lives of faith, it, this strange time after these last 15, 16 months, I think we can be charged to look at the middle of the story as much as the beginning or the end, where Saul, the tall adult king, gives his armor and places it on the diminutive David. And what happens? It's too heavy. It's bulky. David can barely walk in it. There's no way that David is going to be able to wear this coat of iron mail, take down Goliath, and help the Israelites see another day. So David said, I cannot wear these. I am not used to them. So the armor is dropped to the wayside on the ground, and David prepares to face Goliath in the way that he knows best. In everyday clothes, with no sword, armed only what he knows, and with hope that God is leading him. Now, for centuries, preachers have been interpreting this story as one of encouragement, one that helps us to tackle the big problems in life. And I think we can get behind that interpretation because it is encouraging. But I think it's even more encouraging when we look at the journey in the story rather than the result. David, self-aware of who he is and what he needs, self-actualized enough to communicate it in that moment, lose the armor, and move forward with hope and with confidence. And the echoes of God speaking to us through the story. I can hear the call to seek to know ourselves better, individually and as a community, and to be our authentic selves together and in this world to put down the armor, to put down the tribalism of our own day, to step forward with the tools of our experience and what our faith is really saying. As Christians, we trust that God leads us in a unique way, not as a God of battle beyond us, but as a spirit of grace within and amongst us, the Holy Spirit of encouragement and acceptance and care. And so our challenge, I believe, is twofold. First, to seek to be more self-aware and self-actualized, so that we may be people who share grace with a world that is often weary of our own Christian faith, often weary of the word church, due to harms done by so many Christians and so much of our Christian culture over the years. Second, we can seek to be a community at Westminster that trusts in the Spirit's guidance and leading. God leads for us through the Spirit. A community comfortable in our own clothes, comfortable in our own ethic of love, comfortable in our own call to serve, comfortable in our own membership and where we are headed. Because when we are increasingly comfortable in those ways, we continue to grow into God's vision of who we can be as individuals and as a community. Community that supports each other when we face the giants of life that are grief and shame, disease and defeat. We are called to be a community that walks alongside each other, inspired by the stories of our faith, even when they have some ugly parts and encouraged by the Spirit leading us individually, day after day. Encouraged by the Spirit that binds us together, leading us as a people, day after day. So if we seek to be more and more comfortable in our identity as people and as a church family, we begin to worship 
and connect and learn and serve more deeply and more impactfully as well in God's world. So today's charge from the story of David and Goliath is to encourage each other more and more. Maybe find someone in our church family or someone in our world who's having a tough time and give them a word of encouragement. To affirm each other more and more as well and to be supportive of each other when those difficult giants of life are looming. When we do those things with hope in God's grace that leads us, we can truly trust that God leads when we feel like underdogs. We can truly trust that when we seek to support and amplify the voice of the marginalized underdog in our world here in Lincoln, we can trust and know that God's Spirit leads wherever we go, and maybe we'll be so bold to follow. To God be the glory. Amen.
Presbyterians, we believe that gratitude, thanksgiving, and praise are our response to God's grace in our lives. So recently we've been having a moment of gratitude in our service. I think we had a glitch with last week, so it didn't actually make the service. But this week we are celebrating someone who many of you know has been celebrated uh, within our community in Lincoln and within our state recently. That's Martha Kingsbury. She was uh, sort of named and recognized as the Nebraska Library Association Outstanding Volunteer this week. And I want to say a special word of gratitude to her and others who have been a great help and leadership for our library at the church. We have a wonderful library. And as you may have seen in the Evine this week, we are looking ahead to a to-be-determined week in August. We'll share that soon. Uh, when we will have our annual book sale here at the church. It'll be in Fellowship Hall and we will share more about that as the details come together. But Martha has been in some great conversation with us about continuing that beloved event and that opportunity for our church family and for our neighbors. And so as we give thanks, we also give thanks through prayer. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for all of those in the life of our church who give and of their time and give of their effort and their energy and of their gifts and their skills. Folks who help us to have a wonderful resource in our library and to have a book sale that helps others to read and to hear new stories and expand our view of the world around us. So God, we do give you thanks for the gift of our library volunteers and for the resource that we have here at the church. Amen. And as I, we shared in the Evine as well recently, if you have your own moment of gratitude, something that you're thankful for in the life of the church or connected to a church member, uh, you are welcome to email that to me at the church office, and I will uh, be bringing that to life at some point in, a ser in, in our moment of gratitude in a worship service. And additionally, if you would like to share a moment of gratitude, you may reach out to me as well, and we can work that in at some point when it works for you. So I hope you all uh, will continue to give thanks for the good gifts of God in our lives and in this world. Almighty God, share the news that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. We lift up our thanks. We thank you for our church and the church community. We thank you for the promise of hope that you bring. We thank you for providing comfort when we have doubt and anxiety. We thank you for being our loving and faithful Lord. We thank you for the courage to choose our five smooth stones to use in our own battles. Forgive us, Lord, we forget to appreciate your power to help us. For how we allow critical remarks by others to negatively impact our lives. When we fail to trust in your love, battling the giants that confront us, such as disease, depression, dependence, or dissatisfaction. When work to be completed seems overwhelming and impossible. When we fail to remember that we are not alone. And forgive us, Lord, for failing to have a faithful heart. We pray in your wonderful name for those in need. We pray for the people in our church who lack the resources they need. We pray for the people in Lincoln who need to be fed and protected. We pray for the people in this nation who have closed minds. We pray for the people leading this nation and give them hope. We pray for your precious words. Go, and the Lord be with you. We pray for all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught disciples when they pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as our service ends, your service in God's world begins or continues.
So as we have heard the story of David and Goliath, seen it maybe in some different lenses, I hope you will be encouraged to recognize who you are and whose you are, who God has made you to be, live into that reality, and seek to care for, lift up, and amplify the voices of those who are seen on the margins of our own communities today. We are called to be people who seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God as we seek to care for those in our world. So may you be encouraged and challenged to do so this week. And now may the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and lift you up this day and every day. Amen.